suppose, this is a, a ridiculous illustration, but let's suppose for just a minute that you are, you are in a pickup game of some sort on a ball field. And you're said, and somebody says, come on out and play. But you don't know what the game is, and you don't know the rules. Comfortable or uncomfortable? I mean, if you're going to enter a game, you want to know the rules when. And symbolically to this day, even in pro sports, the, uh, the team leaders come out on the field and agree to the rules of the game when. Coin toss, talk about the rules of the game. And theoretically, if they don't both agree to the rules of the game, they have the option to do what? Not going to play. Now, as kids, when you didn't clearly establish the rules of the game, and you didn't clearly establish where first base is, home plate, what's going to be a touchdown, if you don't establish those things very clearly at the beginning of the game, before you ever start, what is likely to happen at some point during the game? <clears throat> Dispute. Yes, which ends in a bloody nose, and I'll take my ball and go home. So it's not it's not a coincidence that that's carried through to us as adults. When I, when I would negotiate with my son, which is many times what it was to mow the yard. Now, in exchange for mowing the yard, he wanted to know what. So we'd establish that up front. Now, at the end, when he mowed the yard for X amount of money, if I said, "Hey, bud, can you help me with a couple of things before you leave?" He really technically has every right to say what? You should have mentioned that before we started. And here's the point. I promise you that right now there are two people in a car going to a sales call. <clears throat> Raleigh, Savannah, Augusta. And here's what the conversation in the car sounds like. Today's the day. Got the stuff in the back seat. That we it's the right time. We've met with these people. We know what they want. Today's the day that we're going to what? Close them. Now, there's always a disconnect where back in Savannah, you've got these business partners. One is standing in the doorway of another with a coffee mug saying, Joey, who's that coming into 11 today? Oh, a couple of people to talk to us about our... Listen, I'm going to leave here a little early to play golf. Why don't you see what they've got? We'll talk about it later. Now... Without both decision makers, is this, is this deal going to happen today? So the time to manage all those expectations is when. By the way, I drive a Tahoe that gets 17.8 miles a gallon. Now you may want for me to drive to Atlanta because my car is larger and more comfortable, technically safer. But if my expectation is that I want help with the gas, what's the appropriate way for me to do it? To get there and to fill it up and say, 82.50, your share is, let's see, what's that, 41.25? If that was my expectation, I should have managed that expectation when? I mean, if that's what I want, if that's what I need, I should have said, listen, if I'm okay driving to Atlanta, get any problem with you helping with the gas? Or, if I drive this time, you'd be comfortable driving next time? Or, if I'm comfortable getting our team to prepare a proposal for this, is there any challenge with having Joe involved in that meeting? where we're negotiating for something and understanding our value. <clears throat> and all we're really doing is managing expectations to make people more comfortable or less comfortable. I mean, you want, you want to know what to expect. Because you know what people are thinking in some of your calls? Here's, here's what their self-talk is. I wonder what he's going to try to close me. I wonder how much this is going to cost. Wonder what it is he's trying to sell me. Wonder how long this is going to take. And because of that pent up anxiety, it does what to their ability to trust us? <coughs> so, bless you. Professionally, we want to do what? Just simply manage expectations. Done right, this is about mutual. This is not about coercion and pressure. It's about professionally managing the expectations. You know, if somebody said to me, this is an absurd analogy, but if they said, Bill, you can no longer use upfront contracts. You can no longer do that. I would quit selling. I would quit selling. It's too much pressure. It's pressure on me and it's pressure on them. See, I promise there have been people in a sales call where you were trying to close them and you know what they're thinking? Or they, some have even said it to you. I didn't know I was going to have to make a decision today. I mean, if that's your expectation, if there's an appropriate time for them to make a decision, you might want to manage that expectation when. I had a call in Greenville, talking with the owner of the company. I qualified him thoroughly over the phone, 
And I said, what would you like to do next? And he said, well, I think it makes sense for us to get together. Now, I, I don't do it very often, but I agreed to go see him at his place. Now, if I'm going to do that, by the way, how long does it take? If I'm going to go on a sales call in Greenville, how many hours will I invest? We'll see? Four. Yes, at least, all right? I mean, let's see. Two hours one way? Let's call it an hour and a half. Times two is three. The call is likely to last how long? An hour, let's call it four. I mean, there's going to be some dead time before and after, so it could be five. And now you're in scramble mode when you get back because you've burned half a day. See, what I want you to be thinking about is, is equal business stature. I mean, you're pretty good at what you do. You've been at it a long time. Quit subordinating yourself. I'm not talking about greater. I'm not talking about lesser. The operative word here is what? Equal business stature. And understanding the value in what you do. Latin expression, which really means what? Something for something. Because here's my thinking, that I'm a professional. I see myself of equal business stature. He wants me to come up to Greenville. What's something reasonable to get in return? In this case, he's the owner of the business. He assures me that he's going to have everybody there, his choice, that would need to explore who we are, what we do. So I have a step where he could agree to a little assessment step that wouldn't mean we'd become clients, but would really help us explore what we do, how we do it, and whether or not he needs to work with us. I think that's a reasonable exchange. What's an hour of your time worth? What's an hour of your time worth? Let me give you some very simple math. If you, if you make $100,000, and I promise it's more than you think, if you add in the FICA and the cell car and the cell phone and the 401k and all that stuff, if you're making 70, it's really 100. Okay, but let's use this baseline number. And let's assume that you're working 40 hours per week, just to make it really easy. Okay, to make it really easy, let's call it 50 weeks in a year, making it really easier, okay? Assuming we take two weeks off, which equals 2,000 hours. So if we take this total amount of dollars and divide it by 2,000 hours, it's what? 50 bucks an hour. Is that right? Now, if this number is 200, it's 100 bucks an hour. If this number is 400, it's 200 bucks an hour. A front contract is about dealing with both parties' biggest fears up front. I mean, think about it. Isn't it fair that both you and they have legitimate fears? In fact, let's, let's break this down for just a minute. I want you to put on your, your prospect or your buyer's cap for just a minute. Put on your buyer's cap. Take me literally here, okay? You're now the buyer. You're busy. You've got a lot planned for today, don't you? So what, what are some of your fears? If you know that there's a salesperson out in the foyer that wants to talk to you, Stephen, what's one of your biggest fears? Waste my time. Yes. I mean, you ever had a salesperson waste your time? By the way, if we let that happen, what might that say about us? another fear that you might just normally have as a normal human being when there's a salesperson out there? What do you think, Joe? What's another normal fear that any buyer would have when they're about to talk to a salesperson? I don't need what they have. Yes. They'll sell me. You don't need it. <clears throat> Let's suppose we could manage 
manage that fear and eliminate that fear. What's another fear that you might, that a, that a prospect might have? How about, how about a feeling of, of pressure? Okay. Equal business stature. Equal business stature. How about the salesperson? You know what? Caveat emptor, buyer beware. Caveat venditor, seller beware. How many of you learned that you got played a little bit? They shocked your price, they put you off, they hit behind their voicemail, they say they're not interested when they don't even know what you do. They shocked you, they used you as a free consultant. So, is it fair to say that you might have biggest fears too, as, a, as an equal business stature? What are some of your biggest fears? What do you think? Joey, what's a normal biggest fear that any salesperson should have? <clears throat> Keely, what's the biggest fear that you might have if you're in a selling situation? break it down a different way because that implies some neediness. Um, my, is your, by the way, is your time? I'm, I'm concerned they'll waste my time. Or they'll call time on me. Okay. See, I was going to say you don't get enough time to uh, explain why you're there or your product. Yes. Waste my time or you don't get enough. Okay, now here's, here's a favorite ploy. Uh, listen, we'll show my time. And then comes the, can you send me a proposal, see me next week, uh, how about call me next time you're in town? Okay. They'll either take too much of your time, or they cut your time short. How about that they mislead you or don't tell the truth? Times do you, how many times have you said, boy, let me think that over, and in your mind you were saying, the answer's no. See, the most, pardon my language, but the most damning of all objections is that nebulous, hey, just let me think that over. Non-specific. Because with that objection, there's nothing to handle. If they give you a specific objection, and they have a concern about X, then you can deal with X. Pricing, delivery, you can deal with that. But if they say nicely, hey, just give me some time to think it over. And many times they just get rid of us. Okay. That happened more to me one time. So it was a big deal, <clears throat> a real big deal. I had two owners in the room, and they said, we need a little bit of time to think. And we have three people in the room, and I said, how about we go drink some coffee, and we'll come back in 45 minutes. And uh, they agreed to it, and we closed the deal. So that can happen. That can happen. What's another example of a biggest fear that you might have? How about instead of saying yes, they give you that, hey, I want to think it over. Which, if you get 100, hey, let me think that over. If you get how 100 of those, what percentage do you think close? What do you guess? How many of you have been out of the wild? Jeff, you get 100. Hey, let me think that over, Jeff. After your very best pitch, what percent of those clubs? Small. <clears throat> very small. Very small, Joey? 2%. 2 percent, maybe. 2 percent. So that's not the most desirable outcome, is it? 